Okay, guys. Um, due to technical reasons, my talk on Monday, uh, the recording failed. And uh, that's why I'm doing on my own now a run through of my talk on Monday so that we get a video recording this way. Bear with me just a second. I will share the screen. Okay, guys. So, welcome to the workshop on my behalf. Uh, my talk today, this is like a, so the idea is for this talk to serve as an introduction to this uh, workshop before we go into more uh, technical details. My talk, Transmission Electron Microscopy, Basics of Edith's Formation. Uh, and my name is Pasi Laurinmäki. Uh, I'm an electron microscopist here at our uh, institute. Um, the idea of this talk is that you as researchers are of course familiar with your um, sample in the wet lab where you purify it for EM. Also, you become familiar with the data that is provided by the microscope. Uh, and this talk is uh, aim to give you a general idea of what happens in the basement at the microscope, how the image is formed in electron microscope. I would like to start the talk uh, with a uh, motivation. Electron microscopes come in many sizes and shapes, but they are always relatively complicated and expensive. Why do we need them? Um, resolution of traditional light microscope is fundamentally limited by the wavelength of photons. Instead of photons, in electron microscopes, we use electrons for imaging the sample. Compared to photons, high energy electrons have a wavelength that is shorter by several orders of magnitude, allowing higher resolution. The motivation for TEM can be summarized in one image. Using electrons for imaging allows us to directly view and further analyze the structures of viruses and even individual proteins down to atomic or near atomic resolution. How does this uh, look like in practice? Uh, this moving from this domain towards here. Here we have a, this dark mass is a cell grown on a cryoemcrete. It's then vitrified. And here we have what is considered low magnification for cryo-EM or transmission electron microscopy. To give you a sense of uh, scale, the one of these holes in the supporting film is about the size of one uh, E. coli bacterial cell. Uh, here we have philopodium protruding from the cell grown on the crete. Uh, this is a mammalian cell. And, uh, and we are interested in looking at the details on the philopodium and use electron microscope for that. Here we have the same philopodium showing you the actin filaments within uh, the outer membrane. Looking more closer still, we can see easily the repeating protein units building the actin filament. And in case of well-prepared sample of free purified protein or regular array, like in these actin filaments, we can then take this kind of raw data and process it to access the high resolution information, giving us in the best case scenarios, atomic resolution or near atomic resolution, allowing us to look for coordinates of individual amino acid with acids within the protein structure. Other way of looking at this, this um, about uh, two decades ago, it was still considered a good achievement to get the biological structure to sub nanometer range. These days with modern instrument and with well-behaving uh, sample, it is relatively standard to get to the so-called atomic resolution range. This 3.5 angstrom 
limit is important. If you go beyond that, you can reliably assign the densities for the side chains of the amino acids uh, in an amino acid chain. And this is important because it, allow, it opens up the toolbox originally developed for structural biology, especially analysis of X-ray structures. And if you know the amino acid sequence of your protein, you can reliably model the coordinates of the amino acids within that structure. Now, moving on to how we uh, get the images, how does the electron microscope work? I'm not going to go into particular technical details, but look at the, the aim is to give you an overview of uh, how the electron microscope is built and how does it function. Let's look at the main components of transmission electron microscope. Here we have a Typical modern transmission electron microscope, which is encased in an outer shell like this, that basically looks like a big box. Um, this is actually a picture of the instrument that we will be using uh, during this uh, workshop. And it's also the instrument that was used to collect the data that uh, the attendees will uh, process during the workshop. Opening the outer shell, we see uh, Plenty of equipment. Uh, this uh, functioning TM has several support systems that includes pneumatics, fine mechanics, water cooling, etc. But the main part of the, the actual microscope is centered around the microscope column here. We have on top electron source, condenser lens system, sample stage holding the sample, objective lens system, projector lens system, and Finally, detector system that is used to detect the electrodes. Looking inside the column, we see that main part of the volume is taken up by large magnets, water-cooled magnets that create the magnetic lenses. In the center, we have a vacuum tube in which the electrons traverse. The magnetic lenses are used to manipulate the path of the electrons. Conceptually, this is analogous to the way the glass lenses are used in a light microscope. Yes, sorry for that break. In the case of uh, cryo-EM, the sample stage and sample are kept in liquid nitrogen temperature at about minus 180 Celsius. So the main difference compared to traditional transmission electron microscope of room temperature specimens, when we move to cryo-electron microscopy, the, the key is that the sample has to be kept at liquid nitrogen temperature all the time. And uh, the microscope has to be specially equipped with a special cryo sample holder that uh, keeps the sample in liquid nitrogen temperature during imaging. Now let's look at what happens at the sample here when the electron beam hits it. The high electron uh, energy electron beam hits the sample and the electrons interact with the sample molecules and atoms and atom cores. Uh, as a result, we have backscattered electrons bouncing back, secondary electrons kicked out of the sample atoms and, uh, and emitting of photons uh, like cathodoluminescence and X-rays emitted from the sample atoms. Uh, all these can be recorded with specialized detectors and you, that, will, that is a way to get information from your sample. So, but things that happen above the sample are fall under the domain of technique called scanning electron microscopy. And this is not covered during this talk and for structural biology anyways, we are interested in transmission electron microscopy, which is looking at the sample by looking at the electrons that pass through the sample. We have inelastically scattered electrons that have given away part of the energy to the sample atoms. There are elastically scattered electrons that still have their full energy, but their flight paths are diverged by the interaction with the sample. And we have unscattered electrons that have just passed through the sample. 
we record these unscattered electrons and use that information to get a two-dimensional projection image of our sample. In order to see something, we need to have contrast between the different areas of the sample. The contrast uh, can be sp split in two major types, amplitude contrast and phase contrast. Uh, if we have here a very electron dense area in the sample, more high ratio of ele electrons are scattered. Whereas when we have very light uh, area of the sample, uh, the ratio of unscattered electrons is higher. This type of contrast is called amplitude contrast. In negatively stained TEM, the sample is stained with heavy metal salt, dehydrated and then imaged. In the example image on the right, the dark areas contain electron scattering heavy atoms from the stain. This type of contrast, as I mentioned, is called amplitude contrast. However, for high resolution structure determination, we prefer to image unstained biological samples in aqueous solution. This is called cryo -ear. And here we have to rely on a phase contrast. With light elements embedded like carbon of the amino acids, embedded in a matrix of light elements, the water, the amplitude contrast is very weak. So we need to introduce this phase contrast in order to see the sample. In TEM, the phase contrast can be modulated by varying the defocus. What follows is that in cryo EM, we intentionally collect underfocused data that then has a boosted phase contrast component. This imaging strategy is necessary to yield contrast, but it comes with a price. The signal for sample features is modulated by the sinusoid phase contrast component. The resulting artifacts have to be corrected, deconvoluted during image processing. Uh, going into details of that is beyond uh, the scope of my lecture, but you will hear more about it later during this workshop. In addition to have, having to have conditions that provide uh, good enough contrast in the images, we need to negotiate another significant issue. This is the issue of beam damage. So we have the high, ele high energy electrons hitting the sample. High energy electrons are a form of ionizing radiation. As the high energy electrons interact with the sample, they break atomic bonds within the sample molecules and create free radicals that cause secondary alterations. These beam damage effects accumulate rapidly and destroy the features of interest. In this example here, we have simian virus 40 particles embedded in vitreous water. And at 10 electrons per square angstroms, the main features of the coat proteins are still intact. But as we increase the dose, we can see that the structure of the coat protein is lost due to basically breaking up of the coat protein. We manage this beam damage by a so-called low dose imaging strategy. It can also be called minimal dose imaging strategy. The main idea with this is that we only look for features of interest at low magnification, meaning low electron dose per square. Then we perform um, critical imaging tasks like focusing that require a high electron dose, not on the area of interest, but next to it. And thus we preserve the actual area of interest until we record the actual recorded image. Here, we have a very low magnification overview of our cryo -EM grid. And here we can look for areas that seem to have a thin uh, ice and in and film support film for which is good for imaging. So we choose here, for example, this grid square, then go to intermediate magnification, 
lower intermediate magn magnification, let's say that, and find a promising looking hole, which we then still at intermediate magnification and low electron dose, we center on that hole, which is our area of interest. We are gonna record an image in the center of the hole, and we perform tasks like focusing and diffract, uh, drift measurement on the carbon film next to our area of interest, taking care so that the beam is uh, condensed enough so that it doesn't overlap with the area of interest, thus preserving the area. And then we just record the image in this case of our proteins embedded in the eyes. Um, this uh, talk is now coming to an end and uh, I would like to conclude by showing you variety of uh, biological samples, just examples of what we have imaged over the years, starting from bigger things and moving towards smaller things. Um, we've been watching at lipid nanoparticles, purified bacterial organelles, lipid nanolattices, virus-like particles, many different viruses. But these days, most of our work is uh, focused on purified protein complexes that are picked out from the raw data and used for single particle structure determination. This is actually, this image can be considered an appetizer or a taster for this workshop. It's actually a snapshot from one of the data sets collected for this workshop and one of the groups will be processing this data. With this, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Um, I would like to apologize that because uh, this talk, original recording of the talk failed due to technical reasons. Uh, basically the Zoom app crashed that was doing the recording. Um, we don't have now the user's questions, but if I remember correctly, uh, the questions that were asked have been addressed during the later talks and, and during the workshop otherwise. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you, goodbye.